the year of no turning back. We know that no turning back requires that we uh, just decide that we're done with our old life. Isn't that right? We're, we're finished with our old ways. We're not going back to unbelief. We're not going back to the lifestyles we used to live. We're not going back to the way we used to talk. We're not going back to the way we used to walk. We're, we decided we're moving forward and we're going to be represent, representatives of God. Isn't that right? So we're not turning back. We're happy. I don't know about you. I'm happy I'm saved. I'm, I'm glad I'm saved. We ought to be happy that we're saved, glad that we're saved, grateful and thankful that we're saved, and that we're different, and that we're called to something great, and we're called to a life that's different, a life of peace, a, a life of power. You know, we raised our hands just now. We want to live lives of power. And so maybe, maybe your life or my life, we had weak lives. Maybe we were shy people, intimidated people. But now God wants us to leave all that stuff behind. No turning back to that. We want the boldness of the Lord to operate. So we have to stand up and be who God created us to be. And so we have to, uh, I, I know some, somebody said uh, when we're afraid to do things, we just have to do things afraid. How I many of you know that's right? Because if we don't just do it, even when we're afraid, we will never do it. And so no turning back means I'm not going to be afraid of doing what's new. I'm not going to be afraid of following God. I'm not going to be afraid of obeying what he tells me to do. I'm not going to be afraid to walk in the word of God and declare the word of God like it's so and like it's the truth. And not us being afraid to declare what a scripture says just because we've never seen it come to pass in our lives. That doesn't mean it's not true. Amen. Just like when I, uh, you know, when uh, Pastor Lamont passed away and I had to come the next day and preach three services. And I laid awake, awake that night. You know, when my, when my pastor at the time, he told me, Connie, you're going to have to go preach tomorrow. At first I was like, what? But I laid in bed that night, and I knew that I had to come tell everybody that God is still God, and it doesn't matter who dies, God is still a healer. He's still a healer. And so we have to be bold enough to declare the works of the Lord. We have to be bold enough to say what God says and to declare the word of God. And so, you know, a lot of people got shocked and they got thrown off course, but I, I, we, I, we don't care who dies. I don't care who dies. If God didn't die, God's still a healer. And, and every, we all know he's not dying. He's not going anywhere. He's the ancient of days. He's, uh, he's eternity. And so healing is available to all of us. And so we can't be afraid to say what God says. Matter of fact, that's the only way things are going to happen. Amen. You realize that, right? Yes. The only thing, the only way something's going to change in our lives is if we say what God says. Amen. It's the word of God that changes things. And so this is the year, no turning back. And today we're going to talk briefly about not tempting God. All right? And so we don't want to tempt God. I didn't, I didn't give them scriptures today, so... I need you to um, just go to the scriptures yourself, all right? Okay, let me just get to my, find my right page. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Psalm 78, let's go there. Psalm 78, starting in verse 40. How many of you were blessed last week talking about rebellion? Get, getting rid of the root of rebellion. And our life is going to change. Psalm 78 and starting in verse 40. I'm going to read that. And it says, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him. I'm sorry, I want to read in, in the Amplified. How often they defied and rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Verse 41, and time and again, they turned back 
and tempted God, provoking and licensed and incensing the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not seriously the miracles of the working of his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Verse 56, in the King James Version, it says, the same chapter says, Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. And so that's why it's so important for us. <laughs> we don't want what our fathers had for the most part. Isn't that right? And so that means we're going to have to do something different and we're going to have to believe something different. And that means we're going to have to trust God. And we're not going to fall back to old habits, old patterns, old curses. Come on, y'all. Old curses, old ways, old, did I say patterns? We don't want to go back to the old things. We want new patterns. And so, so, so they turned back and they tempted God. They made God angry. Tempting God is not, it's really not trusting God. And, and a lot of uh, tempting God is based on what we're saying. How many of you ever had your children complain about you? Well, mom, you shouldn't do stuff like that or, or you don't know what you're doing. You know, they tempted, the Israelites tempted God in the wilderness. Those people didn't know nothing. They didn't know nothing. They, God took them out of slavery. He did all those great miracles. He he brought frogs and darkness and turned the water into blood and uh, killed their firstborn until Pharaoh let them go. And so God pulled them out of place of being a nobody. Come on, y'all. I don't know about you, but I was a nobody. Nobody, you know, I wasn't anybody special. And so, therefore, I didn't know what I was doing. Did you know what you were doing? Do, do, right. Do you know what God knows? And so they tempted God. They, God showed them miracle after miracle. And that's why I'm convinced we need to see some miracles. And we need some power around here so that people can see it, so that we can see it, so that we have something to testify about, so we can say God did this, God did that. It was miraculous. It was awesome. It was powerful. And that's why we want his presence here. So that God can show himself strong in our midst. This is where God is going to stop here. You know, Dr. Barkley shared a, a, a vision uh, a few, several years ago. And he said, God is going to begin to walk up and down the aisles of churches. To see who is really following him. And who really believes him. And so I purposed, when I heard that, I had already decided anyway that God was going to walk up and down these aisles. And he was going to see that you and I are serious about the things of God and serious about his power. You know, we experience God's love and mercy and healing and things like that, but we want to experience his power. I want to see something. I want to see more than what we're seeing now, and that's what God wants to do. And so, so God has showed them all those great things. He uh, uh, split the Red Sea, and uh, he gave them uh, bread from heaven. He did all these supernatural, miraculous things, and they still had the nerve to complain. And they didn't know nothing. God was just trying to lead them. How many of you know when God, God is trying to lead us? And when, as he leads us, because the word of God says, you've never been this way before, then we got to act like we've never been this way before and just listen to what God says and do and go where he says. When he says, do this, when he says, say that, when he says, be here, we need to just go and do and be. Because we need to trust him. And so they tempted him time after time. Um, the verse in um, Numbers chapter 14, verses 20 to 23. You can turn there, Numbers. Numbers 20. 
Numbers 20. You might be sitting here today saying, well, I don't tempt God. Mm -hmm. Well, I think maybe so. <laughs> Numbers chapter 20, verses 20 to 23. And it says... 20 to 23, it says, then he said, Numbers 20, then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out, that is not, 14, I'm at Numbers 20. <laughs> numbers 14, verse 20. Thank you, Minister Kim. And it says, then the Lord said, I have pardoned According to your word, the, the children of Israel had just sinned and Moses prayed for them. And verse 20 says, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, Moses' word. Verse 21, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded to my voice. And so God is making a statement here, said, these people, they have seen my work, they have seen my power, and still yet ten times, every time I manifested myself to them supernaturally, they still tested me and tempted me. Let me read you the, a definition of tempting, tempted. Tempted, it's the Hebrew word nosaw and the Greek word in the New Testament, pyrazo. And it means to put to proof or test God's character and power. Now, first of all, who are we to put God to proof, to test him and test his character and his power? Yet we do it all the time. When God gives us a scripture, when he tells us to obey his commandments, when he tells us to tithe, when he tells us, um, uh, uh, seek you first the kingdom of God, and we just discount it. We say, oh, it can't be, it, it can't be that easy, or he, he can't mean that. And so we tempt all, God all the time. And tempting God, it, it also means... Um, distrusting him. We just don't believe what he says. How many of you, without raising your hand, I know that there's been a time or two or a hundred <laughs> where God said something. He told you something. You read it in his word and you doubted what he said. That's why our situations are the way they are right now, because we don't believe God. And that's the honest to God's truth because God wants to change things. And the only thing, only way things are going to change is through his word and through his promises and doing what he tells us to do. Amen. That word, it also means, it's, it gives a definition here. It says, men are said to tempt God by exhibitions of distrust as though they wished to try whether he is not justly distrusted. In other words, well, let's, let's, uh, I'm going to read one more definition and then we'll, we'll go into um, a few samples, okay? The word tempted, it also means by impi we tempt God through impious or wicked conduct to test God's justice and patience and to challenge him as it were to give proof of his perf uh, perfections. How many of you remember when uh, Jesus was tempted in Luke chapter 4? And the devil said, go ahead and, and, and uh, throw yourself down from this high pinnacle. Uh, the scripture says that God will, will save you. He, uh, the scripture says he'll keep you even from dashing your foot on a stone. Well, what was Jesus' answer? He said, thou, he said it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, in other words, God could save him if he jumped off of that cliff. But first of all, <laughs> so, so he didn't want to tempt God. So I'm not going to test God like that. You know, when we live careless, reckless lives and live lives that are dangerous, we have Christians that, that, that are 
uh, living lives of Russian roulette. You know, but the scripture says your sin will find you out. And so we can't just do what we want to do. Thank God for his mercy, right? But we're not supposed to tempt him and just do any old careless thing that we want to do or go against his word and think that, he, that what, he, what he promised in the word, if you do what you do, is going, it, it's going to happen. Eventually it's going to happen. And thank God for his long suffering. We can keep doing something for a long time, but after a while, something's going to go down. And so we don't want to tempt God that way. We don't want to push him and have him look at us and say, what is she doing? What is she doing? Does she, oh, she thinks I'm just going to get her out of that situation that she put herself in, that I'm just going to save him from that reckless decision that he made and nothing's going to happen. Well, that's tempting God. He can do it. But we don't want to tempt him and just stretch him and push him and just think that nothing is going to happen. And so after a while, when we don't live lifestyles that are conducive to the word of God, if we don't obey God's word, eventually we are going to see the results of it. Amen? And so when God tells us to do something, we do it. And so we don't want to tempt him. And we don't want to exhibit character and actions of distrust in, in front of God. Amen? And so we want to do what he says. All right, so they, test, they tested God ten, 10 times, and so I'm going to go over a couple really quick. Exodus t uh, 14, verses 10 through 12. Exodus 14, verses 10 through 12. Exodus 14. 10 through 12. All right, this was at the Red Sea. All right, now, <laughs> when I read some of these scriptures, I want us to be able to hear ourselves. Now, we weren't trapped at the Red Sea. This is when the Israelites were at the Red Sea. Pharaoh was behind, behind them. He was chasing them, him and his army. And then they end up at the Red Sea. And they think they're trapped. And of course, God tells Moses, he said, put out your rod, and then things start to happen. But before that happens, they have something to say. And this is distrusting God. And, and th these are the type of things that we do all the time. Verse, verse 10, it says, and when Pharaoh, Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now, God just did all those supernatural, wonderful, fantastic things. How many of you were, were the dirty dog, a low-down dirty dog before you got saved? And all of a sudden, something happens, and... God gives us another instruction, and we forgot where we came from. Like all of a sudden, God doesn't know what he's doing. Like all of a sudden, God didn't do, he didn't do all that. He didn't do all that much. And then something new comes along, and we start to doubt him and talk about him. <laughs> and so it says, and so, so look at what they do. So they start complaining, and, and they get sarcastic. And it says, because, verse 11, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, we sh than, than that we should die in the wilderness, oh my goodness, how quickly we forget. How quickly we forget God just paid our mortgage. God just moved supernaturally in my body and in my health. And all of a sudden we face a new situation and all of a sudden God doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, oh, is th this is too hard for God. This, this is different. Yes, he did that, but now this is different. 
Why, why did God save me? How many Christians have said this? Why did God save me? My life was easier when I was a sinner. Well, easy in hell ain't saying nothing. It's better to have it hard and on the way to heaven than to have it easy and on the way to hell. Isn't that right? And so, so we murmur and complain and we doubt God and we tempt him when we don't trust him. When we don't trust him to see us through. When we don't trust him to give us the victory. We, we, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll read there too, but it, it says that uh, to beware that we don't tempt Christ like they tempted God in the wilderness. And so every time they bumped up against something, they act like they was going to die. Is that right? Well, if we bring that, roll that fast forward to the New Testament, uh, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So we're going to have to do some dying, y'all. And dying is not comfortable. Dying is not cookie cutter. We don't know what way you're going to have to be cut. What you, how you're going to have to be cut, cut is different than how I'm going to have to be cut. But I can guarantee you it's going to be uncomfortable. But God knows what he's doing. Tell somebody God knows what he's doing. Say, don't doubt him. And don't tempt him. God knows what he's doing. And so whatever new thing, God wants to do a new thing constantly. Whatever new thing he wants to do in our lives, we have to make sure we are standing and operating in faith. And that the first thing, we tempt God by the first thing coming out of our mouth is unbelief and complaining. I'm convinced that this year will be a better year for us if we would just start being thankful. You know, um, uh, something happened, I, I might have shared this with y'all, but something happened, it, it was different, and um, it didn't go the way that I planned it on going, but I just changed my perspective and said, well, that must not have been the thing that I was supposed to have. I can't remember what it was, but we got to change, the, we got to change our confession. We have to stop tempting God. When we complain about God's provision, we complain about him. When we complain about our bodies, when we complain about our husbands, when we complain about our homes, not to say you can't advance your home and, you know, plan on moving, but when we complain about what we have currently, we're complaining about our provider. And God sees that as tempting him. But we can't get past, we can't get past the situation we can't come out on the other side if we decide I'm going to doubt God and I'm going to complain and whine all the way. We're not going to see anything. So, so in my opinion, the, 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 bigger, the bigger part of tempting, is comp tempting God is complaining. Complaining about his com provisions. Complaining that he doesn't move fast enough. Complaining that he doesn't do things the way we would do something. Complaining that he doesn't do, he didn't do that. Uh, he's not going to do that when I wanted to get done. I wanted to get done now. I wanted to get done in two weeks. But see, we don't even, like the Israelites, they didn't know where they were going. They're stuck. They're in the wilderness. God's leading them by day and by night. They don't know where they're going. But God is trying to prove to them, I'm going to take care of you. Tell somebody, God is going to take care of you. Because God, tell him this, because God can take care of you better than you can take care of you. No matter how smart, you don't have to say this, no matter how smart, no matter how intelligent, no matter how business savvy you are, no matter if you're in the medical field, you got five doctorates and, you know, it doesn't matter. Matter of fact, that kind of stuff will get you in real trouble. You get that, you get, you get so educated, you think you're smarter than God. Well, 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 if that was me, I would do it this way and, uh, you know. 
well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not logical. Faith is not logical at all. And that's what trips us up. Faith is not logical. Faith is supernatural. And faith jumps over stuff. Faith bypasses stuff. Faith rolls over stuff and runs it down until, until we never see that thing again. <laughs> Make it disappear. We never, we would ne nobody would ever know it was that way before. And so we have to learn how to not tempt God by complaining about his leadership, complaining about his sovereignty, complaining about his ability. And so they were, they got to the Red Sea and they, and they had the nerve to say, oh, oh, God brought us out here to kill us. He, we went through all this just to die. Now, how many of you know that's sarcastic? That's tempting God. And so, of course, Moses put out his rod. God had him covered. He knew what he was doing. He just didn't do it when they thought, the minute that they thought it should get done. And so they just started to run their unbelieving mouths like some, some Christians do before God even has a chance to do anything. He's got a plan. It, it's, it, it's in the working. God is probably like this. And then we start complaining and say, oh, God's not doing nothing and nothing's changing. This word doesn't work and coming to church doesn't work and my husband's never going to change and my wife is never going to change and prayer doesn't do anything. I've been praying, praying for months. Nothing's changing. All that is tempting God. And tempting God, all tempting God does is hold things up. It holds things up. And so, so when they got to the Red Sea, trapped by Pharaoh, they got sarcastic. They tested God. And, and now, y'all know, they could have turned around and said, okay, God, now what? Right? We can say, okay, God, this, I didn't expect this situation right here. I said, but okay, okay, God, now what do I do? Instead of saying, Dad, God, you brought me all the way. What, you trying to kill me? Don't you know what's going on in my life? You trying to make me lose my house? You trying to make me lose my kids, my husband? Instead of just saying, God, what's next? What you, what's, what's, what you going to do next, God? What's happening? I know you have a plan, God. I don't understand, but I know you got a plan. And so we just have to learn how to look at things differently. We have to start being thankful and grateful. And when things don't work out the way we think they should work out, we should, we should figure out God's got another plan. No, that didn't work out the way I would have thought and the way I would have planned, but God must have another plan because I'm believing for this. I've been standing on the word of God for this. I've been, I've been claiming scriptures. I've been praying about it. I've been confessing what I'm believing God for. So, God, I know you working things out. All things are working together for my good as I continue to pray. And so, when, because when we don't do that, we are asking for trouble. Because we have an enemy. We can't keep the enemy out of the picture. The enemy knows unbelief when he hears it. And so do his cohorts. So, do, so does his army. And so we don't want to, when we tempt God and murmur and complain against him, we allow the enemy to come in. Just like last week we talked about rebellion. When we're rebellious, we allow the enemy to come in and have something in common with us because he's a rebellion. Or he's rebellious. And so we connect with him. And so Satan, he doesn't believe. He doesn't have any faith. And so when we don't have faith, we still make that connection. And we give him an open door. We want to close all these doors. We want to close every door that we can to prevent the enemy from operating in our lives. And it's not hard. And one simple thing is to... Either keep our mouth shut or say what God says. And to talk belief, faith and belief in God. 
and not give any room to the enemy. Amen? Praise the Lord. You can write this down, number two, and then I'll, I'll end here. The second time that they tempted God, they, he tempted them ten times. That's what God complained about. He said, they, they saw all that I did. They saw my glory. When God moves in your life, when he provides something for you, when he gives you peace of mind, when he heals you, when he helps you get a home, get an apartment, get a job, when he helps you keep your family together, that's God's glory showing up in your life. And in my life, when God is doing something, when he's active, we, when we can see the results of God in our lives, that's his glory. Amen? And that's what he wants to do. Exodus 15, 22 to 24. And then we'll end here. Exodus 15, 22 to 24. This is when uh, they got thirsty. And it says, so Moses brought Israel, uh, uh, Exodus 15, starting in verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Now, now they crossed the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people, com they did what? The people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, we learned last week that rebellion causes us to complain against our leaders, all leaders, whether it's your spiritual leader, whether it's the country leader, a government leader, whether it's the uh, police officers, God put authority into place. And so they complained to Moses. And then in verse 24, it, well, uh, 24 says, and the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said in verse 26, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight... Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And then, uh, then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. So instead of them, you know, so every, every different thing that they bumped into, the first thing they wanted to do was complain. We need to stop complaining and just acknowledge God's provision. Just say, Lord, you're my provider. You're my provider. You said you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So that means provision must be coming from somewhere. And no, God didn't bring us out of the world to bring us into the kingdom only to go thirsty and to go hungry. Because the scripture says, Psalm 37, it says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I, I think that's correct. And, 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 or nor seen his seed begging bread. That's the kind of stuff when it looks like we got dust in our pockets and moths coming out and, you know, and we don't have anything. That's the kind of stuff we need to be saying and say, God, why you let me get this broke? Well, I can guarantee you that's not God's issue. He's not the, he wasn't the orchestrator of that. He had a plan to put something in your hand and in your pocket and in your bank account. And so we don't doubt him. We trust him. Say, Lord, I'm the righteousness of God. And right now, I don't have, I don't have, I can't see any money right now. I don't see any way out. But I know that your word says I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So that means something's coming to my hand soon. Somebody somewhere is going to give me something so I can take care of my, my bills. And, and so much so, God, I believe you that one day I'm going to look like an heir of God. 
So God's going to change your position and your disposition. And there's nothing wrong with looking like God, you're an heir of God, if you want to. So God wants to change our status. He wants to change our situation. And so we don't want to tempt him. We don't want to turn back. We don't want to tempt him. And every time some little change happens, but every time something doesn't go our way, we start tempting God and start complaining. And say, God, why'd you let this happen to me? I'm telling you, stuff is going to happen to us. To challenge us. Isn't that right? We talk about that often enough. God's got to challenge us. We have to grow up. We have to get stronger. We have to get through some hard times to make us stronger. So we won't be easily swayed. So the devil can't easily defeat us. So he can't talk us out of the blessings of God. He wants to talk us out of the blessings of God. So, so, so he's got your MO. He's got our MOs. He knows what our mode of operation is. If I just do this to him, if I just do that to her, if I make somebody say this to her, he already knows our MO. And we fall right into it. But let's, let's fool that joker and let's say, no, devil, I'm more than a conqueror. And you're a defeated foe. And Jesus is my Lord, not you. I turn you down. I got rid of you as my Lord a long time ago. And I have a new Lord, and his name is Jesus. Isn't that right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. And, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that this will be a powerful week for us. And that we would not back down off of your word and off of your promises. And Father, help us to keep our mouths shut where we don't complain about your provisions. But you want to manifest your glory in all of our lives. And Father, we want to be like the Israelites were. People in other countries and other regions, they heard about the Israelites. They heard how you were on their side. They heard how you fought for them. They heard, people heard the miracles you did for them in the wilderness. They heard that they beat armies that were stronger than them, had more soldiers than them. And they feared you and they feared them. So, Father, let us realize whose side we're on and who our God is. And, God, that you do have a plan. Just like Nanette said, Jeremiah 29, 11, God, we know you have thoughts towards us and plans for us, plans for, for hope and a future. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. Father, we thank you that I pray in Jesus' name that this week all of us would see more of your plan for us. Even the hard things. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that any mental block, any unbelief in the lives of your people in this room, that those things will be torn down and shattered from their lives in Jesus' name. And we will see the salvation of the Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you for it. We thank you that you're our God. We thank you that you're our provider. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can be strong in you and in the power of your might. We thank you that where our strength ends, your strength excels. So even when we run out of gas, you pick up the slack. And you show up mightily in our lives, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for the victories. We thank you for victory after victory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.